environment and social, one minute, let me just make sure I've got the formal name, socialist planning and the environment. Okay. We're lucky to have tonight, Paul Cockshot, who's going to start the meeting and then Anders Eklund is going to respond and also put forward some additional points. Um, at various times, they're going to use the share screen to help us follow what the talk is about. Um, what I'm gonna do is in, after they speak, if, if people want, we can take a short break. If you wanna get some tea or coffee, or whatever you want to drink, that's fine as well. And, you know, it, since there's a small number of us, just the, we, can, we can actually have a more of an open discussion rather than your turn and you have to do that. So we can try to do it as, as easy as possible and as soft as possible, that's okay. So Paul and Anders will be speaking for about 20 minutes. I'll let them go a little more if they need it, but only a little, okay? And Paul, are you ready to go? You must unmute. Paul, can't hear you. That's not a good start. All right, <laughs> there we go. Okay. Paul, your volume is wrong. You didn't put the mute, the, the volume is on. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I think somehow the mute button had got pressed. Okay, the... Uh, you sorry, muted. you're, you're muted, muted again. There you go, you got to mute, sorry. It was an accident. Am I okay? Hey, now you're okay. Um, the, it's a, a topic that Alan and I have started writing a book on and only a small bit of the book is is written so far but it's too much even the small bit that's been presented to um fit into a 20 minute slot so i'm just presenting about a third of the first chapter uh notes for about a third of the introductory chapter okay um i've also got we've also got another guy working on it philip daprich who's um my my penultimate oh sorry my ultimate phd student before i retired and he is also a co-author of the book and will be um will have written some of the first chapter but i'm just presenting my my material on it so I'm going to talk about the environmental contexts and threats in the context of deep history. I'll be talking about food constraints, heat constraints, um, structural changes in the mode of production, what must go, what must replace it. I was going to have a section on in-kind economy, but I really don't think it'll fit into 20 minutes. So that's not going to come, I don't think. If need be, I could switch to other slides I've got, but that's not, not planned. Okay, what we have to understand is that what's going on now is something that's happened several times before, in more extreme form, in fact, which is a deglaciation event. The, there's a video here of the last glaciation and deglaciation events. And what you see is that there are huge changes in the landforms of northern Europe over that period. Areas that were densely populated, that are densely populated now, were under dense ice sheets. Areas that are sea now were open plains and land. And the striking thing about it is if you watch the video, the huge shrinkage of land area that occurs in a very short period of time, historically speaking, or geologically speaking, roughly from about um, 11K years ago to, to 8K years ago. The North Sea suddenly develops. Uh, I'm, I'm taking this area because it's, it's obviously familiar to me and Anders. Similar maps could be produced of North America. So, we have to view what's happening in terms of the start of a long-term process by the standards of 
the history of capitalism, but actually quite a short term process by the history of civilization. If you look at the Greenland ice sheet temperature records, you see that there was a phase shift in the Earth's temperature, which occurred about 1100 and 11,500, 11,600 years ago, in which there was an enormously rapid rise in temperature, 22 degrees centigrade rise. Now, that has to have been the result of a series of feedback relationships, probably um, release of methane and carbon dioxide from recently deglaciated peatlands, possibly from um, clathates in the shallow seas. But what it indicates is the capacity of the Earth system to undergo very rapid phase changes. Along with these, uh, now the other thing to notice, that's 22 degrees centigrade change over Greenland. Doesn't mean 22 degrees centigrade change worldwide because of the phenomenal polar amplification. Changes are much stronger in the polar regions. And if you look at the recent period, sorry, um, I'm going the wrong way. Look at the recent period, the polar amplification has given a four degree rise over Greenland. Whereas the general rise across most of the world is maybe between 0.8 and 1.3, depending on the estimates you get. So there's roughly a fourfold amplification um, occurring over the Greenland area. And just as maps, since I can't uh, in, we can't in our book start using people's videos, we've redrawn all the maps. If you look at the situation 10,000 years ago, at the end of the Mesolithic, very little of Europe would have been suitable for agriculture. Obviously there wasn't any agriculture, but there couldn't even in principle have been agriculture over most of Europe. The only area that really is suitable for conversion into agriculture is, is a broadly forest zone. But within a very short period of time of that ice melt occurring and the, the rapid rise in temperature, you get the first agricultural societies arising. Um, less than a, than a millennium later, you have towns being built. Towns being built, which are based on a new mode of production, a mode of production of agriculture, which is different from the mode of production of the Mesolithic, a mode of production which was predominantly um, nomadic, well, so not entirely nomadic in the, in the Mesolithic, but predominantly hunting and gathering, not crop raising. And that's a very short period of time. So you get a climate change driving a change in the mode of production. Uh, and that is obviously a much bigger change in climate than the Holocene optimum or the um, medieval warm period, etc. So you have climate change producing social change. You have the end of the ice age. You have the extinction of the Pleistocene megafauna, which had provided the major protein and energy source for the population prior to that. Hunting no longer became a viable lifestyle. And this forced the adoption of agriculture in Anatolia. Um, and you, subsequently, if Renfrew is like, right, you got the expansion of the Indo-European languages across Europe from an initial agricultural population. And what's significant there is that you have a move down in trophic level. You have the mode of production moves from one base to on a high biological trophic level to one which moves down towards 
the base in trophic levels. And therefore that makes available a much higher throughput of energy and uh, biomass for the population and you get a rapid population expansion. And that population expansion goes on for, for several thousand years without forcing the development of class society until it runs into the limits of the available land for colonization and then you get class polarization developing, landlord classes developing and the, the development of, of class society several thousand years later. But all of this is initially driven by a phase change in the climate. And I said, okay, okay, there was an energy change. There was a move down in trophic level to gathering higher per share of the biological flux that was going through there. But you move, the, what you had was a society still dependent primarily on energy that was being captured by photosynthesis. With the development of feudalism, you get somewhat wider sources of energy. You get muscles of, of human beings, you get the labor of horses, but in addition, you get water wheels and charcoal as significant energy sources. Uh, in this way, feudalism differed from the pre-feudal um, pre class societies, which were almost entirely dependent on human energy. You then get the exhaustion of, of forest fuels in late feudalism, largely due to the clearing of forests by agriculture, sorry, by the iron industry, um, and therefore the, the drive to develop new sources of energy, primarily from coal, uh, steam power arising, and hence the possibility of industrial mode of production and capitalism developing. So there's another phase change occurring, which is the end of fossil fuel use, uh, an end of fossil fuel use that's imposed by the global warming, by the necessity to meet that. And we have to think of planning in terms of planning for the end of capitalist civilization. This is not a short term thing. We're not talking about just a political order. We're talking about an actual mode of material production, the mode of material production that has underlain um, industrial civilization. Now let's look at food first. We can expect long-term rise in world food prices. There's gonna be increasing levels of famine and there's gonna be widespread harvest failures. Now this is baked in, even if it is possible to stop the consumption of um, fossil fuels by 2037, which is roughly the, the, the threshold for limiting it to two degrees, even under a two degree rise in temperature, there's going to be, for example, unreliability of, in Europe of um, imported animal feedstuffs. We're going to have, in Europe will, have problems when you get the failure of the Brazilian and US soy crops, which are likely to occur. Um, but so this is almost certainly going to involve a planned shift to a more vegetarian diet. Now, obviously that occurred in the last glaciation, a shift to a more vegetarian diet, last deglaciation. And there's gonna be a necessity for food planning. I'm saying in Europe, because this is in part based on a talk I gave in Spain at the invitation of the European Parliamentary Socialist Group. Um, there's going to be a need for food planning to ensure self-sufficiency in the face of declining yields. And yields will decline because of less favorable weather conditions. If you think about it um, in terms of fuel consumption, in 2013, according to the IPCC report of 2011, there were roughly 270 billion tons of carbon left that we could still use if you're going to have even a 60% probability 
or 66% probability of limiting global warming to two degrees. Um, if you're willing to settle for a 30% probability of limiting it to two degrees, you can go on for a bit longer. But that basically means that you're going to have to stop using carbon by 2037. Now that, that's only 16 years from now. It's, it's also clear even under the most optimistic scenario that the wildfires are going to become more common. When I first gave this talk, I gave it in Galicia and flying into Galicia, I was struck by, wow, that doesn't look like a Spanish countryside. Where are all these green forests? As we came lower, I saw the eucalyptus forests. The, the, the Galicia has been forested with eucalyptus trees. Of course, eucalyptus forests are being shown in Australia to be very prone to intense forest fires in the event of hot summers and low drought. There are going to be a lot more forest fires. This involves the necessity for planned urban development, not the suburban sprawl, which is very common in the United States, a bit less common in Europe, but it does need to be planned. You can't have the, the spreading out of habitation into semi-forested areas, which is been occurring on a large scale in California, for example. Um, or such areas can't be made safe. In addition, there's issues to do with just the effect of heat. Now, if you go and say, when was the last uh, 400 million, 400 parts per million CO2, which is the current level? Last time it was above that was in the Pliocene, which are 1.5 million years ago. And if you look at the climatic zones or ecological zones in the Pliocene, it doesn't look too bad. It would still be a habitable world. The purple here is areas that would be deciduous forest. Um, I'm sure Anders will note that the deciduous forests are shown spreading far further north in Scandinavia than they do now. Certainly they're, spread, they're shown spreading right across the whole of, of Britain, which is not really viable at the moment. Labrador is shown deciduous forests. And the, there was somewhat more rainfall in the Sahara. Sahara was largely savanna. It wasn't um, desert. So this is a world we could survive in, but there's gonna be a lot of disruption. Areas which are currently quite good for agriculture are going to decline and other areas moving further north are going to become viable for agriculture. Large areas of southern Siberia are going to become viable for agriculture. Areas of Canada, which are far too cold at the moment, are going to become viable. But on the other hand, a lot of areas like the, the around the Gulf Coast in America, in US, will become either too dry or too hot. And these are areas which are key to current agricultural production. Paul, well, you have about five minutes left, just to oh, remind you. Okay. Now, if, if we don't keep it at two degrees and just burn fossil fuel uh, according to the scenario 8.5 in the IPCC, you're going to get much worse conditions you're going to get Eocene type conditions. And if you look at, the, these are maps drawn for our book, but uh, taken from climate models that have been done by the paleoclimatologists. The, if you look at the, what's called the Eocene optimum, vast areas shown pink here, are areas where for part of the year, the wet bulb temperature rises above 35 degrees or used to rise above 35 degrees. Temperature measurements based on lignite in, in India, lignite mines in India, uh, show that these were formed as peat bogs at a temperature of 39 degrees, okay? A peat bog at 39 degrees would have a humidity that would kill 
a human being very quickly. Um, so if we allow it to get to, to four degrees, sorry, if we allow another doubling of CO2, you're going to be in a, uh, have a set of climate zones which are extremely hostile. You also have already set in train a flooding process. And if the flooding process goes on at the same rate as the bolling alarod deglaciation, which was the, the one 11,000 years ago, you're going to, in a in 100 years, you'd lose this much of the Netherlands, large areas of the west of England, etc. So you're going to have to plan the relocation of cities. You're going to, that's under private ownership, that's enormously impeded by the fact that it becomes a private responsibility of someone if their house is going to be flooded. They can't get insurance, they can't sell it, and they're ruined. Um, Basically, it's, it's only viable with state ownership of housing and the state building new houses. Other th infrastructure th things, obviously, all roads have got to be relocated away from low-lying land, railway lines away from low-lying land, ports have got to be moved further up the Rhine. You won't be able to use Rotterdam as the main port of, of Europe. The, it may be as far up as Köln, who knows, but it'll be much further up. And this is a new mode of material production. Now, fossil fuel still provides a very large amount of total energy in Europe. And you've got to reduce that 72% to 0% in at most 25 years, probably 17 years now, uh, which is about 3% a year, which is five times faster than being achieved now. You've got to close all the, the oil and gas power stations. That means a huge investment in new power plant, huge capital investment. I haven't done the calculations of what it is yet. It means building enough nuclear and wind ones to replace other energy uses. And this is important. You've got to replace other energy in uses in process heat, in transport, and in urban heating. So it's not just a matter of replacing all the existing electricity stock, you have to replace electric power for everything else. So ships, how is world trade going to occur without diesel power? Basically, it's going to have to have some kind of uh, sailing power, flat rotors perhaps. Steel, steel production is a huge carbon producer. It uses coal. That can't continue. The only uh, option with the, which the European community is pursuing is direct hydrogen reduction. But that again means a huge extra electrical consumption. And basically it means replacing the entire capital stock of the world steel industry, all the blast furnaces, all the, the capital that's in coking ovens, all of that's got to be replaced by direct reduction furnaces. The coking ovens have all got to be replaced by electrolytic conversion plants. These are enormous capital investments. Basically, the capital investment to replace all the fixed capital stock in ships, trains, roads, new power stations, basic steel, building supply industries. Same, what I've said about steel also applies to concrete and brick building, brick making. You've got to replace a huge amount of urban infrastructure because so many cities are going to get flooded. You've got to build new ports and seawalls and you're going to have agricultural planning. The only historical precedents for this scale of development are the Soviet and Chinese industrializations. Conceivably, you could say the US war economy is an example, but it wasn't involving large quantities of fixed capital stock, the war economy. It used existing capital stock to change the, the content of output. So basically, there are only two big options that's going to be possible for the future mode of production. Either a state capitalist mode of production, which by state capitalist, I mean state-directed capitalism of the form that existed in the 
uh, war economies of the UK and the US in the 1940s, or which occurred in China in the period up to the, the mid 1960s, or a fully socialist planned economy. Both of these um, have certain common features. The state plans the main feature of the economy in material terms, not money terms. The state directs labor from inessential to essential sectors. Um, away, for instance, there's gonna be a big direction of labor away from banking and services to physical production to provide the new capital stock and infrastructure that's gonna be required. There will be various forms of rationing imposed on private consumption. Uh, the state essentially is going to have to finance this. Um, and the investment in infrastructure is going to be at least the order that you currently have in China of about 45% of GNP. Typically, typical capitalist economies peak at 20 to 25%. So th this is going to require planning on a scale which the capitalist world has not seen in the main um, since the Second World War. And Britain continued that form of planning until the early 50s. But in general, it's not something which has been seen in a long time. I'm going to stop it here. I'm going to close the screen. Is that OK? Screen sharing. OK. All right. Okay. Anders, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Can you turn on your picture, please? Makes it easier to follow for deaf people. Yes. Just a minute. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, the, the, the picture, I will go back to the picture uh, later on. But you, as you see, it's Paris, it's the Yellow West, so everybody gets that point. Um, and I think that I agree on almost everything that, that Paul said about sort of physical things and, and uh, um, processes uh, in, in climate and so on. Maybe I think he still underrates that uh, we are the speed is much uh, faster now than even the historical ones because we are talking sort of decades where they maybe needed uh, five centuries we have at no more than, than five decades and maybe even half of that so I think the chaotic uh, features of, of the change the climate change is much harder to predict but that doesn't matter politically because you, you are turning into a precaution principle kind of, of politics. You must do everything to avoid this. It's, it's not important whether you predict the, the catastrophic consequences entirely correct or sort of you miss sort of when it's really going to break down with five or 10 or 15 years because the, these tipping points are unknown. So you just have to do as best as you can. And that points to my major point, I think, which is that Paul is not talking of any political agent who can do this change. Uh, and I think that's a little bit uh, strange from a Marxist perspective, because what Marx and Engels found was, of course, this class, the proletariat, which was going to liberate themselves sort of and fix it all. Fixing it, it uh, for themselves would be to fix it for all. So, uh, Anders, I, I hate to interrupt, but I need ah. you to put your picture up because- Yeah, yeah of course, people, I will. Just people need to use it to read lips. Please do yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, sorry, I will get back to to the. Oops, there's too many screens here now. So let me see where I got that one. Uh, oh, you need to go to the video. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just. Uh, mm. Oh, my. I get, I'm, looks like I'm a little bit locked here. Uh, just be patient with me so I'll find where I should be. Okay, just continue. I'm sorry then. It's just, no, no, no. Let's, 
Uh, okay, let me then just uh, continue uh, because uh, then my major point uh, is how do we mobilize for for change? So and you know I have a lot of uh, typing every day, sorry comrades, because what you're talking about is actually sort of a political optimal control problem. You you have to get some processes moving which will reinforce themselves. So in the long end you will. Uh, fix the climate pr uh, process because you have a sufficiently strong sort of force to change the system. And then comes the next key point, which also I think Paul was way too silent on, uh, which is the left uh, and the carbon price. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, there is a, almost a total silence on this. So everybody's talking about the climate, but nobody is talking about sort of uh, the carbon price, which boils down to the petrol price. And as you saw from the picture, it was when Macron tried to rise the, the petrol price. And everybody knows why he tried to do that, because uh, France is a little bit down uh, currently, but they have a lot of electricity. So if they got a, a price on, on carbon, Germany has a lot of coal, then Ger the German economy would do worse uh, than, uh, than uh, would uh, France, because they have so much nuclear power, so they can sweep out that. So uh, Sarkozy tried it earlier, and he got sort of <coughs> another prostate wave, the so-called red bonnets. Uh, and, and, but this, when you read any kind of uh, person on the left, you can just search for petrol price or sort of increase the gasoline price or increase the carbon price and you mostly find nothing absolutely nothing and then i think uh, paul he didn't put it up in this presentation but he he in a way talks about the the, the carbon price via um, carbon rationing which i don't think is the best idea but at least he, he speaks about it he didn't highlight it now which i think uh, is not good and then, again, the, the problem is how to get onto the par path towards sustainability. To, to, to sort of to outline the end goal is, is good, that's needed, but you need also to, to, to see who will do it and how can we get it done. And then I think uh, when it comes to, to his sort of model, it is far too sort of centralized to put it mildly or autocratic to put it less mildly uh, and then the key political difference between us might then be the the, the role of self-mobilization and, and democracy because i don't believe that you can get any solution here you can't get people moving before you connect their immediate interests to in sort of a more just society and a lot of uh, good things that we can uh, think of with sort of the, the, the long-term need, which is just as material and, and needed, um, which is a stable climate. Okay. Whoops, then it, uh, there it comes. Okay, so mobilizing for, for um, change is immediate. And it's the, the key principle here is that there must no, be no contradiction between people's uh, immediate interests and their long-term interests. And that was very clearly illustrated in France. Because if you have had proposed to the LOSs, which I will outline in more detail later on, a sort of a carbon tax where the revenue was redistributed equally, then of course the poor people would have gained from a higher petrol price and not lost from it. So you would see the, 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 the yellow West in the streets demonstrating to rise uh, the price of petrol and the rich people hating it because that will tax their luxury carbon uh, usage. So this is key to, to getting uh, things started, to get the, the Yellow West on our side and not against us, to get the Trumpists on our side and not against us. Okay, so this uh, social uh, just carbon tax is, you know, for me, a key policy, and uh, which is surprising. I don't, we cannot go into the detail and analyze it. Why is the, the, the left mostly vehemently against this? Or to quote uh, uh, the, um, anti-capitalist resistance, uh, it's um, uh, hated with a ferocity which is hard to understand, to qu quote Alan Thornett. Um, uh, and then I would argue, and this is not a major uh, point in this discussion, I think, is that 
Paul's carbon rationing has the, 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 some weakness, weaknesses of a quota trading because the, the, the poor sells cheap. I mean, if you are in deep shit in the US after the COVID crisis and you have your carbon quota, you will sell it because you need food today. The rich, they will hoard and speculate to make this very sort of uh, simplified and, and uh, so probably setting up a straw man. But I think that uh, a tax with equal uh, distribution, people getting some money, which I can see on their account every month, is a much better and mobilizing way to do it. Okay. Then I think uh, there is another uh, feature which is lacking from Paul's, uh, I wouldn't say thinking, but at least from his presentation, is that you have to, in a way, mobilize people as producers uh, to do uh, green things. And that's where I have, this is very sort of early work in progress, but my slogan is workers against waste. So that when people reduce the, the, the waste of capitalism, they take out the gain, in leisure time or wages or a combination of the two but in norway it would be uh, mainly uh, leisure time so uh, because we must not only reduce the the use of fossil fuels we must respect the planetary boundaries there's no planet b we are overusing a lot of other resources i will not go into that that's documented very well by other people uh, and we must sort of uh, argue that capitalism is an ever expanded uh, and wasteful uh, system. It's ever expanding because it's built on increasing returns to scale. So it's most profits uh, on the last item that you pr produce and it, won't, it needs sort of new investment, new consumption all the time. So it, it is sort of threatening really um, uh, the, the life conditions sort of the threats nature as the condition of human uh, species. And then, of course, we must take away the, the most obvious things, military expenditure, annoying uh, ads, printers that are programmed to, to, to stop after 10,000 copies and all that kind of rubbish. Don't need to go into that. And I will just take one example because it, 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 it is very real. It takes the example of mobile phone chargers because as we all know, firms try to lock us in, Apple into to their charger, uh, Sony into their, uh, Motorola, you just name it. And it's a lot of use of frustration. And that led to uh, that the, the European Commission and everybody sort of a little uh, side here, every, why did they pick up that issue? Because they are heavy mobile phone users and laptop users. And they were so frustrated when they sort of forgot their um, charger in the hotel room and nobody in, with about 20 people there and nobody had a similar charger. And, and so that's why they started on it. And you know, it's no impossibility for capitalism to standardize it because on uh, sort of uh, uh, on ordinary sort of uh, computers, which we had 20 years ago, there is a standard electric cable, power cable, so this three pin thing. But on, on, on laptops, there's a total chaos. Okay, so they used 10 years of campaigning and forced Apple to do into it. Uh, and then we now got USB-C, which is sort of a good thing for everybody. But the point is that it should have been the working class, it should have been the unions who were sort of joining forces, demanding uh, rationality, being sort of the, the leading class in, in rational technical change and taking out the benefit of much less production of chargers and less uh, electronic waste in reduced working time. And uh, that's why I'm surprised that everybody's complaining about the oceans filling up with plastics but nobody is setting as a, as a major political uh, thing to have a deposit return uh, system in their country. US had it, the, the big uh, brewing company, Coca-Cola and sort of, thought it would reduce demand. It doesn't actually, but they took it away. China has nothing. A lot of other European countries has almost nothing. Norway has, for historic reasons, a good one. Okay. But this is, if you, if you grasp that you must mobilize people today, you must mobilize the youth which are concerned, but doesn't have a political program. So the fight for a deposit return system on plastic bottles, that's where you get people moving. That's where you get them behind our banners and not over to the Trumps. Yeah, and you could go on with a very long list. Let me just take retail trade since it's so monopolized. 
in Norway, we are now three chains, which are taking sort of almost 99% of the retail market. And of course, the unions in those three uh, chains should unite to control working hours, which are crazy from 7 to, to, to 11 p.m., which is absolutely horrible. And, you know, in my environment uh, around me here at sort of the rather sort of affluent uh, west end of uh, Oslo, I, in, in, in one kilometer, I have uh, three or four of those shops which are open 7 uh, 23. And, and it's very, very inefficient and a lot of waste of energy and a lot of waste of people's times. Okay, we stopped uh, in alliance with the, with the church to have working days on Sundays. In the US, I hear that shops are open uh, all night, which is crazy, and so on. So we could have campaigns on and mobilize various groups on these sort of consumption reducing, waste reducing things, pointing to that, the, 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 okay, now we are partially fighting capitalism, only a so socialist system, we do this in a, in a fully rational way. But if we don't get people, sort of, if we don't make sort of very visible and clear to people what socialism means, that it means something rational, that it means reduced working time, better days, better lives, we have no hope of stopping uh, this total devastation. Okay, uh, how much time have I got, Susan? Sorry, I was muted. You have another 10 minutes if, if oh, you oh, want okay. it. Then I will very briefly uh, uh, sort of sketch uh, um, a major sort of uh, theoretical or political problem, which to, to the, the very sort of soft title is uh, revolutionist problem solving, but the, the, the short one is Bernstein were right. You know, this all reformism debate. And what I'm saying that, you know, Marx, I don't have to go into it, just to remind you that system change is the uh, relations of production becoming a factor on development of productive forces, which is not happening under capitalism because it is increasing returns to scale. It's always innovative. This is described very well by Marx. And of course, then he has to, the problem in the Communist Manifesto that he has to have some, some thing with the system that makes, that it breaks down, that it is kind of, society can live with that kind of uh, uh, production relations. So he says that the proletariat is sinking below his class. And then he points to the crisis, which we know now that, uh, as I said, uh, the bakery bakes more cake all the time. So there is always a cake to, to, to redistribute if the working class is strong enough. And I'm so lucky that I, for historical coincidences, live in a country where the working class and the workers' movement is very strong. So I'm pretty happy. So incomes are not that uh, unequal. Sort of work security is okay. Living standards, you cannot actually complain. So reformism was a rational strategy and the revolutionary part of the working, uh, of the workers' movement was never more than any kind of minority, a smaller or bigger minority. But this is very important to grasp that sort of the, 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 the pure economic problems of capitalism will not uh, initiate enough uh, sort of uh, criticism of the system among uh, ordinary people. So, so reformism will be their uh, sort of political line to eternity. If it was not a, pro uh, a problem that capitalism cannot solve, and as Paul uh, outlined, and I will not need to repeat, so the, the 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 threat against nature it cannot solve because it doesn't has no price on nature, so it, it just ignores it, pollutes it, uh, hassles it, does all the uh, bad things. Uh, so that is what is uh, uh, coming up as uh, even in the, the sort of in middle layers and uh, even upper middle layers as something which we must do something with, which is sort of uh, global warming, all the other things. Yeah. Uh, uh, the path to sustainability must be a short one. We have just a couple of decades um, and there will be a lot of uh, planned and unplanned trial and error, even before we get to socialism, and especially uh, when we get into socialism, now I'm switching a little bit over to this more sort of linear programming uh, uh, part of, of uh, Paul's uh, work. 
uh, which I'm not against, which I like sort of from a technical point of view. I completely agree with Paul that uh, the data that we need for interfirm transactions and get sort of a full matrix of this, this actually uh, exists. And I'm working like hell in Statistics Norway to get them to create a national accounts from uh, actual firm microdata. But anyhow, what my point is that uh, democracy has a, a fundamental role to play because are, are we going to, to have hydrogen planes? Are we going to invest a lot of time and money in that? Or are we just, as, as in the old time, going to take sort of the, the Trans-Siberian Trans railway to, to Beijing? When I'm lecturing there, I could work for, for a couple of days on the train. If it's a high-speed train, I will be there fairly quick. It's kind of uh, 36 hours or something like that, even less. I haven't done the calculations. So this is the kind of uh, sort of very important infrastructural uh, debates that you cannot solve by linear programming. This needs sort of a huge democratic uh, process. And on the on the lower level, what kind of refilling systems are rational? Should we uh, stop uh, having plastic bottle? Everybody should bring some plastic bottle and fill it up uh, under a tap um, in the shop. All of these you need to and you need to get people on board. Uh, that's my point. We, without these kind of discussions, if you, you, you have to get people on board and then they must be uh, allowed to discuss them. Okay, so uh, uh, the point here is that uh, uh, the, the political controlled market, where sort of carbon price, energy prices, some other prices are key, is not the main problem. I think that's the way that you would rationally sort of use the, the, these prices. They are not correct prices in any sense. They are, are uh, clearly uh, what uh, Jean Allier Martinez, the most famous uh, ecological economist called, there's no correct prices, there's only eco-corrected prices. So you use them sort of in a way to, to with a very visible political hand to force people to change behavior. Because before petrol becomes expensive, you don't take the train. Before, um, when flying is much uh, cheaper than taking the train, you will take the train. And but as long as flying is so cheap, there will be no night train. So you cannot go Oslo, uh, uh, Berlin as you could in the old days. In the old days, you could go Oslo, Copenhagen and Oslo, uh, Stockholm. That doesn't exist because uh, driving is so cheap, so convenient. Okay. Um, uh, and I think there's a, I'm just throwing some questions uh, towards this uh, sort of more sort of computer thing, uh, because is it when we have reached the welfare level as we have in, in UK and Norway, uh, is it possible to say what are essential consumer needs? And, and who is going to de decide that? Uh, looks like you're trying to say something, uh, Susan, but I'm not hearing you. Oh, okay, okay. Um, I'm, I'm almost finished. And then uh, when the states, uh, as Paul outlines, does uh, everything, directs it to finance, it imposes rationing, it uh, gets extensive state rights to requisition of land. Um, who is this state with such wide powers? And I, 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 we really must, uh, you're pointing to, to sort of the chain, uh, Chinese uh, sort of uh, market Stalinism, to use Tariq uh, uh, Ali's, uh, uh, good expression, and then I have lived in, in Eastern Europe, and the people just hated that system. That was a system where the, the relations of production really became a factor on, on, on the uh, um, development of, of the force of production. So it really imploded according to the so what we can call the Marxian law of, of system change, driven, driven by this relationship between relations of uh, production and uh, productive forces. Okay. So that's it. That's my two cents. Excellent. I'm going to close your the, the thing if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, of course. I can. Okay. Uh, Just makes it a lot easier. No, no, I can do it myself even. I was. Oh, that's right. I've done it. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> what I wanted to do is do people need to take a few minutes break to get a cup of tea? Do anything like that? You want to take about two minutes? You can get some fresh tea or something to drink. Yes. yes. Okay, take two minutes, two yeah. and a half minutes, and then we'll come back because I have some questions. I'm sure other people have some questions. Is that okay, Ellen? Oh, so you could unmute yourself. This is a democratic thing. You could unmute yourself. 
Okay. Open open the mute so we can hear. Oh yes. I, I just wanted to say I don't mean to be rude, but I, I have something else I need to get to at one. So Okay, uh, how are oh all right, so we won't take a break then. Let's uh for me, we'll let you just... raise your point and then we can take a break after that. How is that? This way you because it's yes, important yes. that you get your point of course if you have to leave. Okay, right. go I, ahead. I, I have one specific question on the relationship between Paul's ideas and Anders' ideas. Um, Anders talked about a, a democratic or sort of popular carbon tax that returns the revenue from the uh, tax collected to the people. Yes. Uh, and I think, well, that certainly sounds good, but in what form does it get returned to the people? Because I think Paul's point is also a very strong one. There's going to have to be a great increase in the proportion of the national product devoted to investment to achieve the, the change in the mode of production that's required. So I don't think the revenue from the carbon tax could be uh, given back to the people in the form of, say, an income tax cut. It has to be, you know, a future, uh, a future oriented thing. Hey, we're going to use that revenue to build the, the new infrastructure and capital stock that's that we're going to need and certainly your children are going to need. Okay, I, I will, let me put it that way. Uh, I mean, you have to rise the price of carbon. Um, uh, if not, it will be used to the end of, 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 of the world. So, 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 uh, so the, the point is then, when you, when you rise the price of carbon, if you're going to get people to agree with that, then they have to be reimbursed for the price rise, the general price rise. Of course, mostly visible on the petrol pump, but it, everything which is carbon heavy will rise in price. Things which are less carbon heavy will rise less in price. So you will get sort of a shift in the economy towards fossil low or fossil light uh, products. And what you need for, for investment from, from the state, you can just, uh, I, don't, I don't recommend sort of uh, generally uh, modern monetary theory, but there's no problem of just uh, sort of the state creating that money, just starting those uh, huge programs. That's Keynes uh, uh, 101 uh, in a way. So the, the, the critical point is to get people to agree to a rise in the petrol price. And if you don't do that, nothing will happen. You, will, you won't even need those investments, uh, the, those green investments, because as long as you continue to use fossil fuels, so as long as it's so cheap to, to fly, nothing will happen. So, so that's where you are really locked in. So you, the political mobilization, uh, or as I usually say it in, when I talk about this, is that the transition must be just. And if it's not just, there will be no transition. So that's why this uh, carbon tax, and even in a way, uh, Paul's rationing has the same logic in it. The poor sells their quotas and get sort of an income increase. Uh, so we, these two systems are just uh, technically sort of politically different. They can have a special debate on what they like the most. I'm clearly in favor of, of sort of this very visible, very uh, democratic, where you just uh, agree on the tax rate, you get this amount back, you don't sell everything, you have no stock exchange for sort of, sort of um, speculation in, in carbon quotas. But let me not uh, get, go, go into that because it's not a key point. One point on this that I wanted to ask, because the nature of carbon taxes, because we're trying to eliminate the use of carbons at this short term. So they will have a period of time even if all the money goes back through a dis redistribution of income, it's still going to be necessarily of a short term thing because we want to get people off of it. So you could either do, you know, you can do a short, okay, here's this and start scaling up, but it is only going to be a short run thing. And what's going to happen through the elimination process, it, it's, it's set up to do that. Now, the problem is, how is it that we can get people on board if we say, okay, I am, I'm not fighting you on this. I, I, I have no trouble with it. A lot of people are upset about carbon taxes for the obvious reason is that some people will be allowed to pollute if they can afford to pay the taxes. But that's another issue. Uh, okay, Alan has to, 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 to go. Okay, but, I need to go, but thanks very much. This was nice, for being, uh, this nice is, to meet you. We can yeah, continue fine, this fine. later on. It's an important get more people next time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a great first start. Don't yeah. worry, we'll get more. Yeah, uh, but let me uh, respond to, to, to Susan because uh, you could even 
this is now uh, so I mean so high on the political agenda in Norway because uh, just be, uh, on the 12th uh, 9th of December uh, the deputy leader of the Norwegian Labour Party wrote um, an article in the left-wing daily paper uh, called uh, just uh, climate policy where she was sort of talking about this idea that that is new from the Labour Party but the case is that the Socialist Left Party, uh, the, the former Mar Maoist Party and the Green Party, which are together sort of 15-17%, they have a huge uh, increase in support and membership over the last year, all of them have in principle agreed to this uh, uh, CFD, the carbon fee and dividend uh, mm -hmm. system. So the, the Labour Party had to pick it up. And then it was, we are down more to the, the technical details, but uh, uh, of course you would Technically, you would advance it so that people would get one month in advance. Before the price increase starts, they will get some extra money. And then, of course, we will keep it stable over the year so people can plan, people and business can plan, and so on. The Norwegian state has no shortage of cash, um, not even formally. I have a huge sovereign fund. So the state is just buffering that because it's the political thing to get support that, that it's visible every month. People look forward to get sort of an increased uh, carbon uh, reimbursement and, 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 and so we go. So then you have it going. Okay. Like um, Paul, to, 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 yeah. uh, Paul had his hand raised. His fiscal hand, yes. Uh, you need to unmute Paul. I mean, if there's not too much noise in your background, you can just okay. keep the mic on. The, the, there are a couple points there. You say the, the Norwegian state can easily afford it. Well, the Norwegian state can easily afford it because it's pumping lots of oil out of the, the, the sea. Um, now, changing consumption of oil within Norway is just gesture politics. Real politics would be to close down the Norwegian and the Scottish oil industries. Okay. Now, the, the thing about the advantage of rationing over taxing is you levy a tax, you don't know how much of a reduction in carbon production, that, in carbon consumption that's going to produce. If you impose physical constraints like banning the production of fossil fueled cars from say 2024. You know that from 2024, all the new cars are going to be electric and there'll be no further increase in fossil fuel consumption from them. If you impose a carbon ration, which is given to all citizens and you reduce that by 5% a year, and that at the oil wells and at the coal mines, oil can only be raised and coal only raised in su surrendering of appropriate carbon ration certificates, you are imposing a physical control that you know will work. And the, my view is you've got to move from a money economy and a price economy to an economy that is going to work in terms of natural units, as Neurath was talking. You have to move towards natural economy, away from price economy. And I don't think any price mechanism can reliably determine when, uh, how much carbon reduction you're going to get. Uh, I, in terms of redistribution, the the ration and selling is exactly the same as the carbon tax. There's no possibility at all of hoarding because they all have to be dated. This is carbon consumption in the next three months. If, if you don't use it in that time, you can't use it. So th there's no hoarding involved. It's a, f it's a flow measure, a flow rationing problem. Um, Okay. Uh, I uh, let me respond. Uh, we could have. Uh, a... Wait. Yeah. Two seconds. All right. 
let's because otherwise it's just going to wind up into yeah. you yelling at each other across across the thing which is and i think that i would like to ask also if other people have something they want to yeah. say as well and then bring them in and then what i would like to do is if that's okay because there's more questions i have questions as well and i also have misgivings i'm sure others as well do so what i would like to do before this goes into this um let's see if we can Oh, there we go. Jerry, would you like to say something besides putting it into the chat? Well, uh, I think that's uh, my reaction to the conversation by Andres and Paul about there, which is that it's not simply a question of uh, policy to adopt, but how the policy would be not ever uh, working people or whether or not it uh, is something that's decided by um, some state authorities and imposed upon people. So I think that what's really needed, I guess it is in keeping it on um, get consensus on the part of people uh, for different ways forward. Um, I think you could be able to make arguments for or against kinds of things like should we should be taxation policy. I think that that's really um, the question really of this side. Would anyone else go ahead, Paul? Yeah, thank you for these two great presentations. I um, really appreciated Paul's effort to put it in. Um, this longer time horizon. I'm not quite sure what we learn from it, though, given that the time horizon for this ecological crisis is so, so much shorter than any of these naturally induced climate crises. I don't think we've got anything comparable in the rate of change. And arguably, it's the rate of change associated with the challenge we face today with the climate crisis that is the strongest argument for a socialist response, a socialist planning response. Um, the market, I don't, you know, I think it's a pretty hard to see how market economy adapt, adapts so rapidly, so comprehensively in such a short time, um, even with the impetus of a, 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 of a carbon fee and distribution scheme that Anders is supporting. I think it's a good scheme, the CFD scheme. I think it's I think it's definitely worth pursuing. I just think it's a tiny part of the much bigger process, and it can, the taxes can be combined with regulations. Need to be combined with regulations. Taxes and regulations need to be eventually will rapidly exhaust themselves in their ability to solve the dramatic problems that Paul was referring to, relocating tens of millions of people away from flooded coastlines rebuilding urban infrastructure. I mean, there's so much that state investment that's going to be required. You know, I, I, all for the CFD, you know, when you put in the bigger scheme of what we need, I, 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 you know, I, I think somehow we need to get our arms around the question of what is this socialist planning process going to look like? And to Jerry's question, what does it mean for us to be committed to a democratic approach to this? I'm not, 100% sure that democracy, I'm supposed to not say this in public, I suppose, but I'm not 100% sure that the democratic quality of this is absolutely paramount, is the absolute sine qua non. Um, the reality is people care a lot about food and survival, uh, just as much as they care about, you know, having their voice heard and the majority opinions respected. Um, but yes, clearly we've got to bring everybody, we've got to bring a lot of people on board, including many of the Trump supporters and the yellow jackets, like yellow vest people. Um, so yeah, I think the democracy challenge is a huge one, but I, I, I'm not sure Anders and Paul are really arguing the same issue, right? So. That, that, that was my sort of sense. So I think, um, I think it's a really interesting question as to if we have these social democratic, advanced social democratic formations willing to commit to something currently like a Green New Deal, you know, what is the position of those of us on the call who are more radical in, in our vision of what the how different the future needs to be? What is our position as, you know, people who advocate socialist planning? Well, what is a useful way for us to intervene in that discussion? To, to move it along without negating, you know, the, the virtues of even small steps like a CFD.
Dave, would you like to speak? I don't know if he's there. Okay, I have a question while well, waiting for him. I mean, one of the things that you know, unfortunately that popped into my mind when you said it's only socialist planning that can do this, I have horrible nightmares of Nazism, okay? And it's the authoritarian nature of the situation that we have to be very careful or we're not gonna have people on board. And this is the thing that makes me very concerned because I think I've had more than enough of uh, what is socialism so, a, a, and you have a state that is imposing things rather than bringing people with you. And I think that's one of the most important things. If we don't bring people with us, we'll always have resistance. And then whatever socialism that we have will not be a socialism of the people, but a form of state capitalism, which, or even worse, a degenerated uh, socialist formation, which we've already experienced the problems with. So I wanna see if we can ground it from more in the support of the population. We know we have young people, but young people are not enough to bring this, but we've got to somehow figure out. And I think, I, you know, I understand what you're saying. I agree with this point, but I, and the thing that really worries me is who's making decisions in, in the state, who controls the state? And this is something too. And this is one of the problems on, on, on the Green New Deal, for example, in the US. What state are we talking about? We're talking about a state that is essentially run by the ruling class. And the only way that this state will actually do something, you know, whether it is if, if they're essentially forced into it or they see no other solution. So they're not necessarily allies. And we're going to, you know, if you look at Biden's Green New Deal compared to the Green New Deal that came out of Britain, which was a much further left position and recognized the importance of certain nationalizations, you know, we, we have to find a way of addressing this. And I agree with Paul that a lot of this cannot be done outside of the control of the state because whether or not the ruling class will actually will actually want to do this, the much more at this point, totally short termists and getting them to actually move in this direction is difficult. The question is how much will they respond to the demands of the population? Um, and one of the biggest things when we're talking about banning fossil fuel use, we also have to offer full free public transport, for example, on the consumer level. We have to shift the type of way that goods are transported as you raise in transport. So we need to move towards rail. We need to move towards rail, which is, which does, uh, you know, there is a whole framework, for example, up the, up the spine of Britain, of England, all the way up to Scotland, that basically hasn't been used for ages. Can we move this for freight train? How do we shift and develop that? Because you can say, well, you can't use cars anymore. That's fine. But unless people who are living in rural areas actually have public transport, which they can use, then basically you're making the situations impossible and we'll never get the support for it. So we need the support for that. And we have to make sure that people can access things. And so this becomes a very important issue. So that's what I wanted to raise. So go ahead, Paul, and then, then we can let Anders go back in. If, can I? Res what this book is, is that I'm working on, is in response to a specific request from a publisher to write a book about planning and the environment. Um, Alan and I have a previous book, Towards a New Socialism, which talk, talks about planning and democracy and the need for direct democracy and plebiscitary mechanisms. And I have done a lot of work in the Glasgow Computer Science Department on developing plebiscitary voting systems with mobile phones that enable the general public to vote securely on topics uh, to do with resource allocation and do it in a way that is verifiable, unlike the US uh, voting system, which is causing absolute chaos at the moment because it's not verifiable. And th these are things which Alan and I have addressed before, but we're not doing it in this book. So yes, you do need to build mass support for, the, for it, and it will be reflected in politics. But on the other hand, states exist to perpetuate the general reproduction of society under the existing mode of production. And when this is threatened, as it is, is example by the COVID crisis, we see that even capitalist states in Europe 
are willing to take very radical measures in terms of expenditure, which they would not normally have dreamt of. And this is just a small foretaste of the types of things that are going to happen. And even the bourgeoisie will end up feeling they have to support some form of planning. And we know from the past experience uh, of the war economy that when a large part of the economy was under state control for issues of national survival, this changes the whole political atmosphere. It no longer appears to be something that is, the economy is no longer just something like natural forces. It becomes something for political debate and political decision making. And the general public realizes that. And I think that will be an inevitable result of it. Jerry has requested a break. Do people want to take a short break? Yeah. Is that okay? Just a few minutes. Yeah. Okay. So we'll be back at 18, 18? Oh, 18, 18 on my thing. Uh, sorry. Uh, 118 on the, in New York. Is that correct? All right. I'm, I'm on 615. So this is my problem in Britain. So whatever. So we'll be back in three minutes. Cool. I'll see you. times over <laughs> often come back to it but um it, i think it would be a pity if this new book of yours uh didn't find a way to address the democratic element of the planning that you say is necessary it's it weighs so much on people's minds um that we find a way to ensure this sort of planning is democratic you've already done all the work <laughs> I, I i would encourage you to see if you could find a way to add a chapter to the project, because I think without that, you, you'll lose half the audience that it should get. That may be a good, may be good advice. Sorry. Is that, that may be good advice. Um, there is an element of um, feeling that I've written about that so many times before, <laughs> that you, you you think, oh God, do I have to rewrite that all again? Um, so so maybe yes, maybe we do put put, put stuff like that in. Uh, at the moment, we, we've we've got a relatively short request a uh, request for a relatively short book from the publisher, um, maybe 130, 140 pages, so that we, we've we've only got six chapters outlined in it. So we'll have to see whether we can fit that in. Yeah. Okay. 
One point I'd like to raise is the question of socialization of services, rather than nationalization, but socialization. And how do we move towards that? That would also help on a certain amount of social reproduction that's being undertaken by women, for example, expansion of things which are not which are more carbon neutral um, rather than what we are in now. And that's something I think that needs to be incorporated into any type of model we're looking at. Um, rather than this nonsense of UBI, we should be looking about how do we actually make sure that what people actually need in this society, mm -hmm. such as like something like 24 hour childcare where people can, you know, not leave their kids there for 24 hours, but actually it's available so that people could actually mm -hmm. participate. So this is something where we can try to break the privatization and personalization of a lot of social reproduction. And that might be something this is something that I wanted to advocate in the discussion that I wanted to raise, is how do we move towards more uh, like a purple job creations, things along those lines. But, okay, Andrews, would you like to respond to anything? Because I know you, you, you've been very polite, so go ahead. Yes, of course. Uh, and before I start, uh, let me go a little bit back to the Yellow Vests because uh, it was an A opener that nobody on the French left, which I have seen, proposed either Paul's scheme or my scheme. So, so before we sort of uh, go at uh, each other's throats, we are actually in sort of in a, in a political alliance. We can then discuss, which I will do uh, in a couple of seconds, uh, which of the schemes are more in, in appealing to people, which are the simplest to grasp, which will be getting most support because it, this is a pure question of, of how can we get uh, the, the West on our side and, and, and not on the other side. So, so I'm, I'm completely open to, to a discussion of that, but I've been in that discussion uh, a lot since Norway, uh, by some historical coincidence, uh, which I am involved in, is the country in Europe where uh, any kind of carbon taxing is the most popular, adopted by three, um, Three part, the three parties on the left. There was a huge alliance of, of Greenpeace, uh, Friends of the Earth, uh, uh, the, the Public Employee Union, uh, and so on. The ma major unions who recently sort of had the manifesto where the first point was this green and just uh, tax reform, which was CFD, just with, uh, with other words. So, so, so it's getting it into these mass movements, which is, uh, is key. And then I would say, uh, when it comes to the technicalities of, of increasing the carbon price in a just way, that it is less important to control the amount because the amount is going, so you're going to be down so rapidly. So if it in five years are easy, this or that doesn't matter because you just increase the price uh, until you can follow that process and then uh, you can speed it up or slow it down mostly you will speed it up <laughs> and, and then you will go to zero because you know in Norway we have a high taxes on alcohol because we want to keep the consumption on a certain level we want to, uh, not to eradicate it completely so that's two different processes and then when you know that in 15 years we should if we are lucky and happy and do a good job we should be using zero and then uh, the, the, the economic predictability, the price, which you then can control with the tax, it's much more important, much more visible, much more democratic. What people get on their accounts will, I will not, they will not care about how many tons it is in the atmosphere. I'm sorry to say, okay, they will care in a sort of broad sense, but they will not care if some, in some more sort of uh, neoclassical sense that we reach precisely this target that year as planned. Uh, that is not important. So I would say that the uh, price is better than, than, than fiscal rationing. In a way, they are the same. When it comes to, to, to sort of have a short-term market and you say they are dated and so on, I overlooked that probably in your slides. So, so I you just then said that the hoarding will be uh, kind of a, a problem. But to, to repeat that, the main problem is that nobody in France proposed it uh, Maxim Combs, who is the main economist for attack, wrote sort of a, some kind, uh, I would say, sort of saying it, it's too little. He says, and he's right, Macron increased too little to have an effect. That's quite correct. Uh, it was uh, uh, not uh, social just, which was also utterly correct. But uh, Maxim Combs, an attack in France, so what? They just left the price that it is. 
so they had nothing to say. I watched several hours uh, of, of uh, both uh, Besançon and uh, Mélenchon uh, in French saying a lot of things about social just justice and all kind of aspects of, of, of French politics, but nothing on the petrol price. And this sort of silence is, is a bad omen. All right, okay. Then uh, when it uh, comes um, uh, to so this, this planning, uh, and let me rephrase it because I think computers, and I love them almost as much as, as uh, Paul, I think, uh, their, their usefulness is really great and that's mostly underestimated on the left. For example, to do life cycle analysis, if we do that, what is sort of the, the, the carbon footprint result of that? When we take everything into consideration, then sort of uh, computers can in, in so both in split seconds give you an answer, they can visualize it, they can visualize different trajectories. So it's a very democratic tool. But to get people sort of uh, when people are in the retail shop, which is closest to me, you need them to take an initiative. What can we do to get greener? And if we want to do this, we will lose out in the comp competition if we do the, this and that. Then, of course, all the other sh shops must do it so that we are on an on a equal footing. If we are going to cut uh, the opening hours by two hours or sort of, as I uh, often try to illustrate it, okay, these shops already exist. And there might be a need for having sort of shops open late in the evening, but inside sort of one, two kilometers, you don't need only one shop because after eight, there's almost nobody in these shops. It's just sort of a, just a sheer waste of electricity and, and manpower. And I think that uh, the, 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 the importance of engaging people in sort of forming society and sort of emancipating and being like some, uh, a green activist as a producer in steel mills. I'm a little bit more ex uh, optimistic when it comes to the steel mills and the hydrogen replacement, but that's a completely technical thing. But let me take, for example, cement production. If you have an increasing um, uh, carbon price, then cement will be expensive. Concrete will be very expensive. So you might shift to uh, glue wood. Recently in Norway, since we are a wood nation, we built, uh, just for demonstration purposes, a 84, um, 84 meter tall building with sort of glue wood. I'm collaborating with Chinese researcher on glue bamboo. So I, I think, but you need this inventiveness and, you know, any kind of state we know, even sort of bright intellectuals must leading the departments cannot know everything. We, we know the, 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 the limitations and, you know, socialism is in a way for me to release this initiative and it will be a kind of chaotic. There will be, <laughs> as we know from private life, we plan something and it turns out not to be as bright as we thought it was. So this will happen on all kinds of levels in society. But this kind of creative control, collective chaos inside, of course, a, a, a common uh, framework where it's of the carbon price and are we going to, to have hydrogen planes or are we going to have ships? Are, are these bigger things are agreed upon. And there, of course, I agree with Paul, there sort of the, the state comes in. And uh, then I must, because it's one of my sort of uh, uh, key points, and it's even more key after sort of the, the late events of the Capitol Hill, it's a, still a mystery to me why the left in the US do not use this hour to, to challenge the electoral system. And when you see sort of the, the Corbyn half expulsion in, in Britain, the time is right, because if he is really expulsed, uh, then it's a very uphill battle when you have a two-party system in first past the post and everything. So when it, when it comes to, to the democracy, I agree with Paul that even you should have just a half page in your uh, introduction to, to say that the, the left is weak on democracy because too many of these, uh, the best activists of the revolutionary nature, they think that the battle will be decided in the streets. They are too much to back in sort of 1850 or 1871 and not after 100 years of parliamentary democracy. And what we will see and have seen is that uh, this is sort of the, 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 the final form of politics to, to call Karl Marx, is the representative democracy. So this, uh, in a way, in my, my view, 
these things all all we should be uh, the first propagandists of the best electoral system because that's just following up sort of the the the, the old demand of the labor movement for universal suffrage in, in our time and and because we have to to get sort of trust and 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 leadership for the green change and that's uh, where I agree with Paul that, of course, CFD is, is just a small thing. I mean, there's a lot of other things to do, but to me, it is the, the best way now uh, to, to start a movement. So because we people are engaged in should they drive less cars uh, and, and so on. I mean, people are trying to restrict themselves voluntarily to, to fly less. So, and this is on, on a mass scale in society. But of course, we know as materialists that that won't happen. People have to drive to work in the US. There are no public transport. So, so, uh, so, so uh, let me just uh, end on the, this particle speech because to illustrate the difference in, in sort of political tactics, I would say, most of the left in Norway is in favor of a ban on fossil fuel cars in 2025. And of course, last month, there was an 87% in December of the cars were plug in, 65% of them were uh, battery electric, so fully electric, because plug ins, these hybrid cars, that's just fake. That's just the lifeline of the oil industry. So we have to be uh, fighting that hard. But anyhow, so in a way, you could see the, 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 say that this, that this, this ban has no consequences. But there are sort of, you have a party, let's say, of, of sort of eight, nine, 12, 15 uh, people who are living really in the mountains. Who doesn't trust these cars? And if you impose a ban, you give all uh, the, 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 the Trumps, they can get them behind them. And, and this ban is completely unnecessary in a way because the price uh, of petrol increasing and increasing will drive them out slowly without this ban. So, so the ban is politically contraproductive. And that I think is sort of uh, difficult on the left. Why do we, I'm completely on Paul's side that we need to have regulations like a, a return deposit. We have to prohibit a, a certain kinds of materials and so on. That goes without saying, but we, we need to focus on these sort of campaigns where we can mobilize and have big effect. And there, see if there is really the starting point and why nothing is happening is because the left is not driving that issue. Yeah. Sorry, Paul, then myself. Okay. Um, on, on the issue of banning cars, when I was talking about banning uh, diesel cars by 2025, I was just talking about banning newly produced ones. I'm assuming people can go on driving the cars yes, they already yes. have. We are talking uh, about the newly produced ones. So that the, the person who lives up in the mountains and has got a diesel car can go on running that until it wears out when they'll have to buy an electric one. Now, leaving it to the market, though, is never going to deal with it because in order to reduce the dependence of the country on cars, that's only a small part of it. You've got to reduce the dependence of the country on lorries. Our, our whole economy depends on lorries moving things. And long distance electric lorries aren't viable. The, the batteries just won't last. So a lot, a lot of old railway lines are going to be reopened. A lot of new railway lines are going to be built. The capacity of the railway lines has got to be stepped up. And that is big, big capital investment. Um, and just on this issue of, can I share a screen for a moment um, oh, and show, show a diagram? Um, can you see that? No. Oh, no. Not yet. Can you see it now? It's yes. Coming. It's coming, yeah. Okay. This is from my last book, How the World Works. And it's a plot of the growth, rate of growth of labor productivity over the years for all, for a about half a dozen or eight leading capitalist countries. And Anders is doubtful about the relations of production being a federal production. 
I think you can actually see it. You can see it in the decline in the rate of growth of labor productivity. Um, so it's slowed down enormously across the capitalist world. It, the cap labor productivity is growing at a fraction of the rate that it used to grow in the early 20th century. We're way past the period of rapid technological uh, development. Uh, if I can get another graph which shows it even more starkly. This shows it for Britain. Okay, um, the labor productivity growth. And if you regress that, you see it, it's projecting down towards zero. The, the, the capitalist property relations or private capitalism really is a better on the, the development of production. And that's really serious, really, really serious, because we're now going into a period, hold on, how do I get rid of this um, stop sharing? Sure. It's on the, on the top of your screen. I'll um, do it for you, Paul, if you need it. Could you switch off the sharing? Yes, I'll do that. Okay, it's done. Okay. Um, it's really a serious issue because we're going to require a huge level of investment, a lot of rebuilding of, of towns away from the sea, all these kinds of things at a time when energy costs are going to rise because there's no doubt that the amount of number of hours of labor you have to pr put into producing energy by these non-fossil fuel saw force forms is greater than the number of hours you have to put in to produce a kilowatt hour from oil or, or gas. So that in terms of labor theory of value, the labor cost of all sorts of things is going to go up because they're all so dependent on energy. And the, that means a decline in the productivity of labor quite generally. And that's coming on top of a period when the rate of growth has almost hit zero. So, I mean, we don't have huge reserves of, of productivity to meet this. It's happening at a time when productivity growth has, has really slowed down. Now, partly that's because the level of investment has gone much, is much lower than it used to be. Uh, okay, I can, you know, why, okay, when we go to the nature of technical change in the capitalist economic system, <laughs> If we have destroyed wages, they have no incentives to introduce exactly technology. So. And exactly we so. have to understand that they destroyed wages. Okay, there was a deliberate destruction of, of not of the subsistence wage level. In Britain, for example, they actually decreased social subsistence wage levels. So if this is the case, the introduction of techni technical change or the introduction investment in things that would increase productivity. It does not happen because it's not profitable. This is basic uh, discussions on competition that we find if you read uh, read Marx or read Shake. This is so the problem. The, the so-called productivity myth is not a myth. We know exactly what's going on. And if they were honest on the television, they would also be. They know why. They want to actually introduce. They, if they really want to, with such a with, with the level of unemployment we have and with the destruction of wages, okay. Increasing productivity is, 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 you know, is something that, that can be done if we were not trapped within the confines of the competition of capitals. But the reality is, why have they done this? And you're looking at the period from the introduction of neoliberalism forward. And the, one of the main objects of neoliberalism was to destroy the power of the unions. Export-led growth, what does that do? Export-led growth deliberately undercuts workers' wages because it's being sold overseas and they don't have to worry about having a, 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 a domestic consumption as much. So it's a whole entire process. So it didn't come out from nowhere. And even if even if we, clo if we close migration, which I strongly oppose, it's not going to raise the rate of wages because the rate of wages has basically been established by capitalists and this race to the bottom is one of the biggest problems we have. So the question is, how do we actually then, given what's going on, there certainly is room for 
uh, technological advancement, there's definitely room for higher wages. And we, our inflation is, we're, it's, we have so much unemployment that even if we recognize the nonsense of the, of the relationship between inflation and unemployment, and this is, we still have so much that we can actually increase wages to do that. The question is, what can we provide in terms of services that requires, that doesn't require that? How do we actually shift the way in which these decisions are being made? And also, how do we base, also, set forward in a national living wage, living, which is something that nobody wants to accept because they're all talking about minimum wages. To get minimum wages, you can't live on them in Britain. You have people that are on food banks who are getting the so-called minimum wage. Benefits were destroyed and this is impacted upon women's, women and children. We have high rates of child poverty in Britain. So to argue that it's the fault of the left, I hate to tell you, it's not the fault of the left. The problem with the left is the left is extremely weak. And that is the case as well. The, tr the organs of the working class are bureaucratized. The organs of the working, like trade unions, are weak because they destroyed industry, industrial production and much of the advanced capitalist world. So in that case, they also undermine trade unionism. So getting trade unions to actually work in care sectors, getting trade unions to actually work in service sectors, this is where we need to be also looking as well. But I want to agree in terms, one of the biggest problems we have, Paul, is like getting, one of my worries about electric cars is the, tech, uh, the technology in use and creating that requires high amounts of cobalt and lithium, much of which live, work, are in developing economies and will be demanding that they pollute their economies in order to give us electric cars. And that's not something I can stomach. And I don't think we have the right to demand that. that that's so why an imperialist sorry. decision to insist upon that. So we've got to figure out a way, both between public transport and allowing, do we really want private ownership of cars? Should we be arguing for something like this? Could people rent them? Things along that where there's limited amounts of these things where we know that we don't want to pollute the whole of the Democratic Republic of the Congo for our demand for electric cars. Well, you, so, okay, I'll shut up now. <laughs> you, a lot of, of transport in towns could be replaced by trolley buses and trams. Uh, but again, that these are expensive. They require a lot of investment. Um, and I think it's misleading to think that we can go through the transition to a green economy without consumption taking a big hit. The question is whose consumption takes a big hit. It, the consumption of the upper middle class and the upper class is going to have to be substantially reduced if wages are going to be increased, for example. But the overall level of consumption in the economy is going to fall. The overall level of consumption is, is probably going to... I mean, current levels of investment in Britain are about 13% of GNP. If you're going to raise that even to the so social democratic levels of 25% of GNP, someone's going to, somewhere there's going to be a hit there's going to be a hit of, of 10%. That's just to get the levels which we had under Harold Wilson. But you're going to need much more than that for a green uh, transition. So all sorts of services, which are just services to the wealthy, like investment advice and banking and things like that, uh, you know, the financial services, so-called industry, people working in that are going to have to retrain to become engineers. You're going to have to close down those things to a large extent. Now, that kind of thing was immediately recognized under wartime conditions. These were de designated non-essential uh, jobs and the people were just um, conscripted. On the other hand, if you're a, a welder on the Glasgow shipyards, that was an essential job. Now, th there's an, a comparable thing that will occur as soon as you start planning large-scale investment like that, you'll find you have to start redeploying people to, to other things. Paul, would you like to say something before? Yes, please. Yeah, 
Maybe I can uh, just ask a question uh, since all people on the call have obviously read a lot about all these environmental issues. Um, I've been struck by how little attention people have paid to um, the argument that Kevin Anderson and others have made that the idea that we need to get to net zero emissions by 2050, maybe that's right, but if it is, it's only that would only be true at the global level, given the trajectory of carbon emissions that uh, we can expect in India and China. His argument was many years ago already that the advanced, richer countries of the north have to reduce their carbon emissions by zero. Essentially, today we should have done it to, to zero today. We don't have tonight till till 2030, let alone to 2050. And um, what that tells me is if that's even halfway right, um, we're, we're headed into a period of inevitable massive crisis. We, you know, and every environmentalist that I've ever met tells me, and even the ones that are out there trumpeting their support for piss weak schemes like cap and trade in California, in private, they will say, I have a cabin in the mountains. It is very well stocked. I know this is impossible. We are way too late. We are headed into catastrophe. Every single one of them. Um, and I, I, I just think, I, I wonder what our politics and what our, rec what our policy recommendations need to be in order to uh, be ready for that moment of crisis, that Pearl Harbor moment, you know, when, you know, in a, perhaps in a one summer season in the United States, you know, we have three or four major cities that are really swamped. You know, we have millions of people evacuating, perhaps associated with fires in California. I mean, these scenarios, you know, we're, we were almost there last summer in the United States, but for the grace of God, we would have had another couple of major hurricanes that swamped major cities. And then it, all hell breaks loose. And where is the left at that point? Where, what, what does the demand for democracy in responding to a crisis look like? And I think we, you know, both Anders and Paul have portrayed, you know, given us different answers as to what a sane approach to policy would look like in the short term and in the long term, but in the intermediate term, we face this massive catastrophic crisis risk. And I wonder, I've, I've been trying to get a sense of what a left politics looks like by way of preparing folks for, to deal with that challenge politically and policy-wise at that moment. I wonder if you've given any thought to it, or, or perhaps you think I'm exaggerating mm -hmm. the likelihood of this sort of crisis breakdown within the next decade or two. Okay. Susie's muted and I'm unmuted. Yeah, go ahead, Andrews. Would you like to say something? Go ahead. Yeah, because I've got uh, another net meeting at, at eight o'clock. It might, I might go a little bit over, but not uh, very much. Um, and uh, I think it's been a very fruitful thing. I will uh, read uh, Paul's book, uh, Towards a New Socialism. That uh, missed my was under my out of my radar, so maybe I've been a little bit unfair to, to him on some points. But uh, let me try to combine Paul and, and uh, Susan because, and again, CFD is the best way you can increase wages when uh, labor unions are weak. So, so you, 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 you got to start sometimes, okay? Unions are weak, but there's a green rhetoric from, from the upper classes. Uh, all the economists are recommending some uh, kind of fair or unfair uh, carbon tax, mostly unfair. So, but my point has been uh, that you could use this green rhetoric when the left is weak. And you should use it because you are in a way pulling in people who are a little bit more well off, but concerned about the green issues. And those who are so the yellow West are as I said, we have to care about the end of the month and not the end of the world. So you, you need to, to, that's what we, that's why CFD is so crucial. It's a big campaign, easy to understand. You can get it rolling. You can get people's uh, sort of trust. I'm an old Maoist and, you know, we sort of really looked for how to get people's trust because then you could manipulate them. Look at the Belgian um, Parti de Travailleurs Belgique, a horrible sect. But they had all the lawyers and doctors in the districts gave free hours consultations 
to poor people. And of course, that attracted poor people, and they knew exactly where poor people were. So when the political situation loosened up, this awful dogmatic sect became sort of 15% party. So learn from that. Learn from so even if it's it, as, as Mao Zedong said, even if it's not the most important issue, it's the first issue where you can get people to trust you, to listen to you, to listen to your social media, and not Fox News. So, um, so that I think sort of if. And that's what trade unionists in Norway have grasped, that the best way they can use now to get, especially for the sort of the cleaners and those where, and restaurant workers where it is difficult, the carbon tax can give them a real increase. So we are talking here about sort of the, the green hundred bucks you would maybe translate it into in US, sort of the, 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 the green thousand kronas, one, 10 kronas, one pound. So it's a sort of the, 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 the every person should get uh, uh, 100 pounds uh, each month on their account. So family will get 2,200. The children will get, you can discuss whether it should be half rate or a full rate. I'm more of a sort of a full rate person. So a family of four will then get 400, which will be very visible, very uh, good. Why should we do that? Okay, a couple of points on the electric cars, just to illustrate one point that left is not looking towards socialist technology because these horrible Teslas, sort of a two-ton car, is not necessary. The Swedes, because they have a, um, a car industry which is, is down in the drains, they are experimenting with putting the power in in the road. That means that you need maybe sort of a battery if it gives you 30, 40, 50 kilometers, one tenth of the Tesla battery, and and, and but that is a social infrastructure. Mm -hmm. That is a social infrastructure and the capitalism abhors social infrastructures. They cannot even change batteries. So we have to load your individual battery. There were people proposing that you just could shuffle in one battery and, to, uh, and take it to the, the, the old one. Doesn't happen in capitalism. It's the same thing with, with the, the cell phones and chargers. That kind of social infrastructure doesn't happen. And that is one very good argument today for socialism and, and sort of public solutions. Uh, and uh, because I agree that we should uh, uh, t take the trains, but for the last mile or the last couple of miles, uh, lorries have to, to do it. And there, Siemens is uh, doing trolley lorries. You can look at the airport outside the uh, Köln, and they have trolley lorries experimenting. Uh, outside Arlanda, the, typically those lorries going for, uh, back and forth to the airplanes. And at Gotland, they are putting, so they have wireless charging of the cars in the road. So, so you and that the, the point is not these technicalities is that this kind of social infrastructure is not possible in capitalism and that's an argument for socialism um, and uh, i did have some when it comes to labor productivity uh, susan has a good point but i have another point that we, which is spreading more maybe in uh, northern europe do we need more things i mean we need other things. We need more nature, peace and quiet. We need sort of rewilderness. So, so I think to, to say the horror of, of capitalism is that the labor productivity is slowing down when people are changing their mobile phones uh, every second year, when you are sort of obesity is a problem, there's a consumer pressure, which means that people, there's a use and throw away society, which people abhor. So we have to, uh, I, so the, I'm not scared to death, uh, and I don't think actually that that uh, capitalism has been uh, fetter on on the uh, development of the productive forces in in Marx sense, even if labor productivity is, is falling. But even if that was the case, I mean it, it's it's not a political issue. It's much more this veganism where people try individually to do something about this uh, unsustainable lifestyle. There is where the left has to to attach, like like fair trade. Fair trade was not driven by uh, by the left. So so again, my main point, and I will stop on that, is that we have to, if we are going to make any headway, we must look for these issues and make them into a program. So I uh, think it would be good if Corbyn uh, went for CFD and uh, uh, Alexandra Ocasio Cortez uh, almost did it. But then she was, it was watered down. Naomi Klein, not personally, but in her book, and if you look at her backing papers, she mentioned this. But it's first when CFD becomes a major common campaign worldwide that things will start. And let me take one single point that in, 
in the, the, the in Paris in 2015, the left had no demands, no concrete demands. There was only system change, not climate change. So I am not trying to, to get good forces in Norway and Europe to agree on three points. There should be a complete ban of all offsets, all fail, this fake uh, uh, swindle, uh, 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 indulgence uh, kind of, of trade. So you, 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 don't, you put up a forest and then some other one can continue having a, a coal power plant, which is completely horrible. And then secondly, you should um, tax international uh, shipping and trade, which is proposed by Oxfam and, and the White Land Fund. And that would raise a lot of money for investment in the South. They propose it to go to the Global South, which I agree on. They, they propose that it should start on uh, 25 US dollars, but it should increase with $10. And then Brazilian Zoya should not be transported all over the world to, to Norway to feed our livestock. That should, of course, be Norwegian grass, which we did in the old times, and we can survive on that. And uh, thirdly, if you, in your, in your country, introduce uh, uh, some kind of carbon prices, I could, uh, if there's a majority for, for uh, Paul's rationing, I will go happily with that. <laughs> but uh, okay, let's take that debate later. But, but the point is, we should, every country, sh the left should demand that, that there should, every country should ask, a part of their contribution to the Paris Agreement have a carbon tax of 10 USD, increasing with 10 USD every year. Then the carbon tax in, in Europe would, in four years, be higher than this fake quota price which we have in Europe now, which is, in a way, the best quota carbon price you have worldwide, actually. It, it's completely fake. I don't, uh, so, but it, since it is existing, that's where it's a handle where the left can get into politics. I'll stop there. Thank you, Anders. Jerry, you want to say something? Yes. Uh, well, I think that the, the debate has to be uh, situated more. Um, you see me? Uh, oh, I'm seeing you, Susan. I can see you. Yeah, we. Okay. Um, I think it has to be situated more with national uh, Even mainstream environmentalists have understood in recent years, you know, the need for uh, climate justice. And um, I think that um, is, uh, how do we address national policy? How do we build a, a international movement? And how do we express international solidarity so that actually be able to come up with policies that really deal with the problem of climate change because the problem, the solution for climate change is within a context of a global problem and it requires global solution. I think that that's one of the major reasons in fact Jerry, maybe you should take off your video because you are dropping out. Yeah, we're, lo we're losing your voice. So put the video off. I muted everybody, but that didn't stop it. So probably better turn off your video. You're on. Uh... Okay. Let's see if that helps. Now your 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 video is still on, Jerry. You're gonna. You have to click the little camera to put stop video. It's on the bottom. All right. Follow oh, Sue, girl. <laughs> that would be, I would make this. No, it's not working, Jerry. I okay, will try again. Check your mic, because it might be the mic is, go, see, it says select a microphone. Check that. So you click the red pointing arrow next to the mic. And see if there's uh, you can do a, same as system or microphone array. See what it has because there's something definitely wrong with that. So it's the up pointing arrow next to your mic. See if that might help because you keep on going in and out and it's hard to understand you. So which is 